Welcome to my presentation, Joy to the Dementia World, strategies to help people living with dementia and their care partners enjoy the holidays. This was taken from a webinar that I did the morning of December 20th, 2021, and here is the replay. Enjoy. Some of you may know more about me because you've been following the podcast or you've been on the Facebook page for a while, but my name is Rita Jablonski. I am a nurse practitioner and I've had a boat ton of education and the common theme throughout all my educational journeys has been geriatrics and gerontology with a focus on neuro because I happen to not like neurology. And prior to 1997, I worked in hospitals and critical care units as a staff nurse. I did have a stint as a supervisor, hated middle management. And from 1997 on, I was licensed as a nurse practitioner, and my practice has been predominantly nursing homes and memory clinics. I do work in a memory clinic right now. I've been there since 2014. And I've always had a foot in academia. In 1988, I started out as a clinical instructor, and I'm now a tenured professor. So my day job is faculty with a faculty practice. And I also do a lot of research. I've been funded almost continuously since 1999 through a variety of funding agencies. And all of my work has involved older adults. I first started out looking at long-term care issues. Then I had a lot of funding into looking at non-drug ways to handle care refusal behavior. I've been funded to provide dementia caregiving. We used it as an intervention for a couple of studies. I am funded currently now through NIH, and I have several studies that are in various areas of beginning stages. And the common theme is I am looking at non-drug ways to handle behaviors. I also am currently funded by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm doing work in nursing homes to improve dementia care and to address antipsychotic use. And I've also been funded by various foundations and internal funding. My contributions to the area of dementia, family caregiving, and dementia care have been identified and recognized through different societies, the Gerontological Society of America and the American Academy of Nursing. I have been awarded an excellence in geriatric teaching award. I have other awards, but where I'm going with all of this is I have external people who look at my work. When you write a grant, it just doesn't you know, show up. You have to compete. And if your idea sucks, you're not going to get funded. So where I'm laying the stage for is everything I'm about to tell you is a culmination of my research, of my teaching, of my faculty practice, and also as a family caregiver. I cared for Mary for nine months. I came into this caregiving role pretty damn freaking prepared, and there were days I just like wanted to cry. So that gave me a lot more sensitivity to the caregiver side. I have a lot of presence on social media. I have my Make Dementia Your Bitch blog. That is the community service arm of my company, Dementia Centric Solutions. So for transparency, I do run a, a company where I work directly with family caregivers and help them with behaviors. Because let's face it, you can educate yourself and do a lot of stuff by trial and error, or you can work with someone and save yourself a lot of time and effort. So that's just putting it out there. And if you want to work with me, we, we can, you know, talk later. So some thoughts about the holidays. When you are making decisions about including your loved one living with dementia, 
to take them out of the facility or travel or to go to different parties. The thought is, are you doing this for them or for you? And I'm not saying it to be judgy or ugly. I just see where caregivers sometimes create situations unwittingly and it turns into a friggin' shit show, to be honest. And I, I often hear things like, this may be his last Christmas, so we're gonna fly to California and spend three days or a week in each kid's house. Or someone will say, I want the kids to know mom and my mom to create memories before she gets worse. And those are all great intentions. And there's nothing wrong with holiday activities. They're just going to need to be tweaked so that the holidays and your own emotions as a caregiver don't accidentally precipitate some of the behaviors. And on top of all of this holiday stuff, we still have COVID-19 concerns and fear of infection. So a lot of good intentions can backfire. And what you will hear in this presentation, the theme is to accommodate the person with dementia, not the other way around. And, and you will have an understanding, but your family and friends may not have a clue. So I'm also going to talk about how to deal with the clueless. So the goals today are to provide supportive and realistic ways for all of you to embrace the holiday season, enjoy this time with your loved one, while avoiding common sources of conflict and stress. So a couple background pieces, because I don't know where, where people are in their knowledge of this disease, but just a couple of things that will help you understand why the strategies work. Dementia is an umbrella term just like car. So I could say car, and that can mean a Ford, a Toyota, a Chevy, a BMW, a Tesla. It can mean a variety of things. Dementia is a catch-all term for various types of neurocognitive disorders. Yeah, nice big word, a fancy word for progressive neurological damage that involves cognition. And I've heard people say, my family member has dementia, but she doesn't have Alzheimer's. And that can be true. You can have dementia and it could be Lewy body or frontotemporal. Or I've had people say the opposite. I've had people say, oh, my mom has Alzheimer's. Thank God she doesn't have dementia. That's like me saying, I have a Ford. Thank goodness I don't have a car. <laughs> and that's okay because even healthcare professionals screw this up all the time. So the common denominator with all the dementias is brain damage. Nerves die. When nerves die, the brain shrinks. On the left is the brain from someone who died from a dementia. On the right is the brain from someone who did not die from dementia, died from something else. So you can see how fat and plump the brain is. And when you look at all of those folds, those are the, the nerves have to touch each other to send chemicals and to send messages to each other. And if there is space, like you see in the left-hand brain, there's places where the highways are gone, the nerves lost, the communication channel. Those loss of channels, loss of networks, help to explain why you lose specific functions over time. So I like to think of the brain as a box of, say, holiday decorations. And my holiday decorations, the oldest decorations are at the bottom. The ones I bought last week are on the top. And that's how our memories work. Our short-term memories are closer to the surface so we can access them. Our long-term memories are buried deeper in the brain. But there are channels that connect to all of these memories. So smells and music can literally hop on an alternative pathway and retrieve a memory. That's why this season is so cool. I will open up my favorite Christmas candles and the smell of the pine and the balsam take me back to when I was five years old helping my mom unpack and put out the Christmas decorations. And at age five, I was probably more of a hindrance than a help. With the, all of the dementias and the brain shrinks, the memories literally fall out. So if my box holding all my decorations were to suddenly shrink, the 
decorations on the bottom would still be there. In fact, they'd be more retrievable, easier to get to, literally on the surface, as if I was there, while my memory of what you told me to do five minutes ago fell out of the box. And because the brain is shrinking, it is really hard to make new memories. That's why, for the most part, when people with dementia no longer can do something, it is pretty impossible to teach them again. Now, there are exceptions to this, especially with vascular dementia. But in the other dementias, there comes a point where there, there can be no learning because there isn't enough neurons or enough brain juice, acetylcholine, to create those memories. An exception besides vascular dementia are emotions. Our emotions can bypass traditional ways to make memories and because there are really two ways to make memories. There's one way, which is a very sequential way we, we create memories. Then there's another way in which highly charged emotions fire up the memory. That's why people who were in a car accident or something traumatic, the memory of those traumatic events aren't like a movie or a, a, a logical sequence like regular memories. They're disjointed. Some things are more pronounced than others. So if you have a highly charged emotional situation, that may fire a memory. And I get that question all the time where people will say, gee, I think she remembers what she wants to remember. Not totally true because my granddaughter is having a baby. So this makes her a great grandma. And since we told her, that's all she's been talking about. She forgot everything else. That's because that emotional charge is not unlike me trying to pack a suitcase where I will take um, an item of clothing and I will smash it into the suitcase. I will make it fit. And that's what emotions do with memories. Okay. So the loss of current memories plus access to older memories literally creates a new reality. That's why you get the same question or topic over and over again, the hamster wheel. That's why people refuse care, because in their mind, they just did it. Or there's no reason for this. If I lost my memory of having high blood pressure, it makes no sense that you're gonna hand me a blood pressure medication. So people with dementia aren't in denial, they have literally moved backward in time to where their current, their older memories are now at the surface. So they're at a point in time where they may not have high blood pressure. They may be at a point in time where they're not married or they haven't had children, which is why they may look at you and forget who you are if you are an adult child. Now, here's another important thing, and I don't say this to freak you out, just to help you understand. If you are stressed out, they will pick up on it. And emotions are contagious. I take a tuning fork in clinic and I hit the tuning fork and I wait till we can't hear it or see it move and I'll stick it in water and it'll throw the water all over the place. We have nerves in our body that are specifically designed to pick up vibration and energy. We are energetic beings. So you may have had the experience of somebody walking in the room and you love this person and your, your energy lights up. They have great energy. How many times have you said, I love her energy or I love her personality. I love his vibrancy. Then there's other people where life gets better as soon as the door hits them in the butt. I had a colleague I worked with once that when she walked into the room, I swear she drained the light out of the room. Like it physically got darker. Like she was a vortex of negativity. Ugh. And that's the reality. So if there is a specific person who's going to stress out, stress out your loved one, it's up to you to maybe limit their interaction or talk to that person because whatever energy they're giving off, they're they're triggering something in your loved, loved one with dementia. So some of the communication techniques that you might have heard me talk about in podcasts or in previous Facebook Lives, or you read them on the blog, is avoid quizzing. Do not say, remember, because that will trigger an argument. Logic also does not work, because when we try to use logic, we are operating on the premise that all of the pieces of the memory are there, but they're not. That's why logic doesn't work. Arguing sure as shit doesn't work. 
and it's best to communicate short, sweet, concrete, and watch your vibes. When I'm in clinic, I literally step out of the room in between patients, and I take some deep breaths and shake off the energy, especially if it was a difficult visit, so I don't walk into the next appointment giving off bad vibes. And I know this sounds like trippy-dippy hippie stuff, but it works. And I was showing you earlier the picture of the shrunk brain, and I talked to you about the highways in the brain. In your healthy brain, when you got up this morning, this is probably what your thoughts were like. You probably were doing pretty okay, life was good, and then about maybe 15 minutes when you started getting involved in your activities. This is what our busy brains look like. We have a lot of traffic going through our neural networks, which is why it's sometimes hard to multitask. Or if your mind is on a problem, you may put your car keys down somewhere and you have no memory of where you put them. No, you do not have dementia. You are distracted and busy. Because when I talk about cognitive activities are not just memory, it's attention, concentration, the ability to focus. It is doing things that we've learned in the past, and I'll talk about that in a sec. In a loved one with dementia, some of the highways are literally wiped out. That's why music and art is so cool. I will have someone who the family has said she hasn't spoken in days or in years, and this person will hear a favorite Christmas carol or a favorite song from the 50s, and next thing they are singing every word. They are right there. Or I have someone who was an accomplished piano player, and I did this in long-term care. I had a resident who we would sit in front of the piano. She couldn't feed herself, but holy cow, you stuck her in front of a piano? off she went because some of her piano playing became an overlearned skill and that skill set was there and by placing her in front of the piano the tactile sensation of the piano hit a detour and got to those memories i i know you've heard this on websites on some of the facebook groups you belong to but it is important to maintain a consistent routine even with the holidays because with little kids we give them routine to create memories to create abilities with older adults with dementia the routine supports the memory and routine actually relieves anxiety and if you relieve anxiety you can reduce some of the wandering because sometimes that wandering is i am afraid or i am something's upsetting me and i'm leaving the environment also for people who always walked or exercise as a way to deal with stress these are the people who get very agitated if they do not have a physical outlet also, consistent routines help prevent pee and poop accidents because if they're eating at the same time, they're going to usually urinate or defecate so many hours later. So it also keeps you in tune with them. Because I have a great picture at the end of what happens when I didn't pay attention to my pandemic puppy, her first Christmas. <laughs> yeah. So some of the ways to really bring joy this year is to take favorite holiday traditions and tweak them. So maybe go to earlier services, less crowded ones. And that's the same idea for live streaming events. You may not want to sit down for an event that you know is going to be hours long. Now, on the other hand, if your loved one is enjoying it and it's a live stream event and they're home, who cares if they get up and walk around and then sit down? Short, frequent visits are way better than these mega gatherings for a variety of reasons. Because you have fewer neurons, the person living with dementia has difficulty filtering out extraneous stuff and concentrating just on the immediate environment. That's why when you notice, a lot of times your loved one with dementia may have that deer in headlights look, especially in crowded gatherings because every single noise and face and stimuli is treated the same by the brain. There is no filter. So you are literally getting everything coming at you with the same frequency. It's also not a bad idea to update out of town family members. I love my family, but there are some members of my family I'm like, what is wrong with you? And I hear this from a lot of my family caregivers, where they will uh, 
actually one of my friends who also is a dementia caregiver, she had the experience where they, for the first time, they were able to go to a Thanksgiving event in two years. And the one of the family members walked up to her father and started interacting with her father and realized he had declined in those two years. And then this family member looks like she's standing there in front of my friend's dad looks at my friend in front of dad and says wow he's gotten worse in the past couple of years thanks idiot so yes there's one in every family or at least one and no quizzing i hate this i hate when i see when i worked in the nursing home and i would see family members walk into a person's room and say hi do you know who i am and the poor person living with dementia, if social cues are still intact, they don't want to be the person who says, yeah, I have no idea who you are. And in so, no, no quizzing. So what I prefer is I prefer things like, so I prefer to just go right up to family members and say, hi, Nana, I'm Rita, I'm Bud's daughter. And if Nana recognizes me, she'll say, of course, I know who you are. If she doesn't, I just helped her out because I don't know if you've been ever been in this situation. I am horrible with faces and names. If you are out of context, I have trouble placing you. That is not a new behavior. That was a behavior ever since I was a little kid. And I remember going to family gatherings, even as a teenager, and different people popping up. And I'm trying to remember who they are and how I'm related. And they want to play 20 questions. And I feel I felt like an idiot. So you don't want to do that to your loved one. And because older memories are intact, this may be a great time to organize photographs or digitally record family history and capture recipes. I had a colleague who went to Columbia to see her mom and her mom is having memory issues and the family was really concerned about losing a lot of the holiday recipes because mom is not a fan of writing down recipes everything's in her head so i gave my friend strategies to go to columbia and have mom make the different foods with support from some other family members and they were able to record her so my one relative was recording another relative was writing things down because mom's one of these people who says this much or I had an aunt who, when we would make pierogies, she would say, the dough has to feel like this. Okay, so I had to touch the dough and, and get a sense of it. Yes, I can make pierogies. I'm doing it Christmas Day with my family. Woohoo! It's also an opportunity to explain to younger family members while the person with dementia may be calling them the wrong name. And I have a great visual for that. Now, the next thing I want to talk about are holiday decorations. And it might be too late because you might already have decorated and one of the things with decorations is they can be problematic so i was looking at floor tile here's my floor tile i was looking at and i took a picture of it because i hated it and then i realized why i hated it i don't know if you can see the outline here but it looks like that looks like a face and that looks like the profile of a duck that's called illusions we all do it our brain wants to make sense so our brain will look at an image and try to put a pattern to it. It's, uh, I think the word is pallidolia. I always have to look that one up. But it's, it's when people look at a potato chip and they see Elvis. Now, if I didn't know who Elvis was, I would look at the potato chip. I wouldn't see anything. So the mind tries to match random patterns to existing images in the image dictionary. And that could be why someone may look at a patterned floor and see the face of a relative because the mind is, has, as the dementia gets worse, the images in the dementia brain are reduced. So you only have a few to work with. So less is more. Not only do you have safety issues with holiday decorations, you have wires and obstacles. You also have increased confusion because of the illusions. Someone may look at all the lights and see something scary. Also, let's face it, it conserves your energy. You're busy enough. You don't need to be decorating the whole house. Now, if you do want to decorate and do things, it's great to incorporate your loved one in existing holiday traditions, but you tweak them. Because here's the thing, and I talk about this in my 
blog and podcast. It's called Tony Bennett, Salmon Patties and Fridge Worms. If you haven't read it, I don't want to spoil it, but I learned the hard way that you have to give people living with dementia outlets and purpose because our need to have a purpose does not go away. It but our outlets do. That's why if any of you are experiencing what's called shadowing, where your loved one is literally your shadow, like they are joined with you at the hip. You can't go to the bathroom. Like you close the bathroom door and they're banging on the door saying to you, where are you? What are you doing? They don't know what to do. And you may often hear the person living with dementia say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. What do I do? And you saying to them, just go read or go do something or stop bothering me. That doesn't help. You have to give them something to do that is aligned with their previous hobbies or things they enjoyed doing in the past or things they did in the past. When I would work night shift in, uh, different parts of the hospital, I would often have an older adult with dementia who at two o'clock in the morning wanted to get out of bed and follow me all around. And I would literally give them uh, pieces of paper to hole punch, or we had stampers back in the olden days because everything was paper and pencil. So I would give them uh, blank progress notes and let them stamp stuff on the progress notes it did like if they did it great if not i didn't care i just wanted to give them something meaningful to do so we wouldn't have an issue and i really didn't want to give them a medication when all they wanted was to be productive so allow them to help with the holiday plans and it's really better to do one to two things a day over the course of weeks, just like the old advent calendars where you would each day you would open up the little drawer and take a chocolate out or just flip the the uh, tab on the poster. You can do, it's late for this holiday, but for next year, you can literally plan out activities that take the entire month of December. So today we're going to pull the box out with the decorations and we're going to put three out tomorrow we're going to put more out because the other question i get is why does the person living with dementia sometimes like get stubborn and mean because they get exhausted and cranky and if you're thinking there's a lot of correlations between certain behaviors at the more moderate to severe stages of dementia which is where a lot of this hits and having a cranky toddler yes and i don't say that out of disrespect I say that because the behaviors are very similar because a toddler has undeveloped brain. The brain's there, the connections haven't been made. A person living with dementia had the connections and they are disappearing. So the ability to handle uh, frustration, the ability to handle emotions, the ability to handle boredom is all greatly reduced in a person living with dementia. So offer opportunities to reminisce as you're doing things. And if you ask someone to do something, short, respectful requests. I have this thing I do in the clinic where I'll say to the person I'm examining, before pointing to the door, point to the ceiling, two-step command, and it's backwards. What they'll do is they can hold on to the last couple of words. So people who are having problems with memory will point to the ceiling. They won't point to the door because they, their brain can only hold one thing. When you go and attempt to give directions that are pretty, like to you, they seem simple. Go to the fridge and get me the butter. No, it won't. So short, sweet, concrete. And express gratitude, because when you think about it, people living with dementia probably don't hear a lot of positive stuff. They're always being told, no, that's wrong no stop that no because you're trying to protect them from themselves how would you feel if all you received was negative feedback all day so that's why when i work with people living with dementia i do provide compliments and i also like to make sure i am being genuine now i talked about your loved one calling a relative by the wrong name on the left side is my niece, Lauren, and she is now 28. And to the right is me when I was five years old. If you 
didn't know the context because you can look at the picture on the right and you can see it that was definitely 1969 1970 christmas because of how dated everything looks in the picture but the person living with dementia doesn't have that context all they know is they're looking at somebody and it's matching up with an image their, their brain is doing the matching so that is one of the reasons why sometimes adult children are mistaken for spouses i look exactly like my mother when she was my age which i feel pretty good because my mom just turned 81 and she looks fantastic and she doesn't look 81 she looks amazing so hopefully i got her beauty genes so one of the things that unfortunately happens every freaking year is, especially if you go someplace or people come to you or you're going to church etc someone is going to try to be helpful and they're really going to be a pain in the ass they're going to say things like oh there's this cure for dementia no there's not okay I've, i actually have a podcast and a blog that basically say a lot of the cures that people are sh selling on the internet are crap and no so here is my all-purpose script for criticism in the form of advice and concern thanks or thanks for asking and then you redirect and assign it you give them something to do thanks for asking can you bring us both some desserts and this is my favorite one when the person living with the men the fountain your sibling or one of your relatives or friends is busy telling you all the things you're doing wrong or why is mom's hair looking like that and you're sitting there thinking to yourself lady it took me 90 minutes to convince her to put this shirt on and 30 minutes to get her in the car and you are asking about why her hair doesn't look perfect thanks for asking or thanks for letting me know please sit with mom while I go to the bathroom I may not even ask I may just say hey please do this and then I had a, a situation where I had a, a family I had sisters one sister was there caring for mom 24 7 the other sister lived in let's say Philadelphia and the sister living in Philly would always pick up the phone and talk to mom mom sounded fine on the phone and mom would tell her all these tall tales which people do and then the sister from Philly would constantly criticize the sister right here in Birmingham providing the care so the sister came down for the holidays and literally what I suggested to the local sister was to use this as respite to set everything up and then go away and took like a weekend and turn off your phone and the caregiver did when she finally turned her phone back on literally like she she lasted maybe 12 hours of not checking her phone when she checked her phone 12 hours later the sister who had so much to say was begging the caregiver to come home because everything was a mess and she couldn't deal with mom anymore so that's not a bad strategy if you have a family member who I don't see what the big deal is here you go stay with mom for a while so this script for criticism in the form of advice and concern it works for a lot of stuff if you're at a family gathering and someone is like making negative comments about your appearance or your weight you can say okay have you tried the potato chips or have you tried I have a colleague who says have you tried the bean dip have you tried the hummus and just redirect them because it is not your job to have to educate everybody and if people are asking a lot of questions tell them to educate themselves so communication is so important especially at this time where you may not be feeling your best there's other people in the environment who really don't know what they're doing so some of the key pieces is to re is for you to realize the person living with dementia forgot that she forgot so when they say something didn't happen it's wiped from their memory banks which is why you avoid remember which is why arguing and logic is pointless i'm sorry i forgot to tell you is actually one of the things i learned to do and i share it so when i was caring for mary and i would say to her okay mary 
you have an appointment on Friday. And I put it on her calendar and I have post-its in her room because reading is an overlearned, overlearned skill. And oftentimes people can still read and understand the written word even much uh, later in, in dementia stages. And at that point she was reading and doing fine. Yet Friday morning, when I, I asked her to get ready to go to the doctors, she looked at me and said, what doctor's appointment? And knowing, knowing all that I know, when you're a family caregiver, you're a family caregiver. I wasn't Rita the nurse practitioner. I was Rita the daughter-in-law. So without thinking, I, start, I went right into arguing and logic. And I stopped myself and went, wow, <laughs> I know better. So I simply said, Mary, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you about the doctor's appointment. And then she went, okay, honey, that's okay. And then she got ready. So that, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. I love that strategy. It's better to just accept the older adults' reality because they are moving backwards in time. Memories are missing. So they're trying to make sense out of what they can get their hands on, what memories are actually retrievable. And when they start talking about dead relatives, I wonder if Uncle Harold's going to get here or I can't wait to see my mom. This is not the time to remind them that mom and Uncle Harold are dead. Don't. It's an opportunity to reminisce. Wow, yeah, Uncle Harold. Wow, he's something else, isn't he? And get them to talk about Uncle Harold. Sometimes talking about dead relatives is really expressing emotion because to me, mom means security and love. Every point in my life where I felt vulnerable or I felt frightened, even as an adult, what do you do? You go visit mom, you pick up the phone, you talk to mom. Or for some of you, you talk to dad. Dad has always been your anchor. And when people say, I want to see my mom, that may be dementia code for I'm scared. I don't know where I am. When people say, I want to go home, you know, that people always struggle with that and say, you are home. And they're looking around going, no, I'm not. Because in their mind, they are seeing the home from maybe 10, 15, 40 years ago. And what you can do is you can respond with, when do you want to go home? I want to go home now. Okay, how about we go home tomorrow? Because right now I want to spend time with you and I want to do stuff. That may be how to handle it. Now, the other topic I do want to address is good intentions with unintended consequences. Alcohol. Yes, we all may want to have a drink, but the person living with dementia may forget that he or she already had a drink and they ask for another. So with alcohol, and, and, if, and depending on the other medications they're taking, alcohol may not be a good idea. So some of your options are, it may be a dry party. It's soft drinks only. If alcohol is there, you may consider diluting it or swapping it with a non-alcoholic make-believe drink. And I've had family members do this a, a variety of creative ways because there are situations where the person living with dementia forgot that they had three glasses already and they're now on their fourth and now we have a fall and a trip to the ER. With overnight visits, that's tricky because if you go someplace overnight, a hotel, a family member's house, sometimes it'll be okay because the person living with dementia spent a lot of time in that house. But if they haven't or you're in an unfamiliar environment, be ready for wandering and falls and incontinence. Those things may happen. The wandering, because they're trying to figure out where they are, and if you're in a hotel room, they may get up in the middle of the night, open the door, step out into the hallway, door shuts behind them, they're locked out. Now they really don't know where they are. They may have incontinence because they're trying to find the bathroom. It's not where, it's their roadmap in their head is not working. You may want to be bring some night lights with you, some additional cheap door locks that you can go on to travel websites. There's all sorts of gizmos for added security and safety. You may want to get some really cheap door alarms that uh, you can pick them up in a lot of hardware stores. Or again, I do everything online, as you can tell from my need to uh, talk to my shipped person. So the 
thing is you can literally put bells or something on the door so if the person attempts to leave the room especially if you're staying in a hotel you are alarmed and some of the real cheap door alarms are nothing but two pieces that literally one sticks on the door and one sticks on the door jam and if the door opens there's a, it pulls out a tab and the alarm goes off you may want to try it at home and to make sure it doesn't wake up the whole hotel but Oh, at least it'll save you from a wandering or incident and, and for an elopement. Air travel can be really, air travel is a challenge, period, especially now. But if you are traveling with someone who has cognitive issues, that's even a big problem. So a lot of hotel uh, uh, airports have family restrooms. The smaller ones, maybe not. But your main ones, family restrooms, that is awesome because I have had family members, the wife has cognitive issues, she goes into the bathroom, she can't figure out how to pull her pants back up, and she's in there freaking out, and the husband doesn't want to walk into the ladies' room because he doesn't want other women to freak out. So that is something to consider. Get pre-board tickets or get permission to pre-board. You may also want to invest in a medical alert bracelet. And I was on the medicalalert.org site and they have some really cool options that even fit onto smart watches. So there's not another piece that the person can wear. Uh, you can have business cards made up or you can do it yourself on your printer and the business card can say a variety of things i've seen business cards that say the person i'm with has alzheimer's please be patient thank you i've had other cards that say my loved one has a brain disease and may show unusual behaviors thank you for your understanding whatever would work for your situation and also masks and sanitizer be prepared now, we still have COVID-19 with us, sadly, and that's going to present some challenges because you may decide, you know what, I really want mom to see her kids. Mom wants to see the grandkids. We'll roll the dice. My son is a state trooper in Florida. Whenever I visit him, I'm going to hug him. In the heat of the pandemic last year, pre-vaccine, my husband, God, my son surprised me with a visit. I didn't know he was coming and he literally showed up. I gave him a hug because I was thinking, pandemic be damned, this could be the last time I hug him because he has the type of job where he may not come home and that sucks. So I was willing to risk me somehow getting infected because hugging him was more important. That's a decision we all have to make. Be careful though with the damn face masks because for those of you listening to the podcast, you can't see the screen. So you may want to go to YouTube and check it out. But there's always somebody in every family who picks the goofiest, weirdest face mask. And it's just freaking creepy. So if you have someone in your family who is going to present with a face mask that looks like he's a monster or it's some bizarre thing, no. <laughs> just stop yeah i have a colleague who has a face mask it looks like the bottom half of a gorilla and it is just disconcerting but she thinks it's cool now you probably have people if you are a caregiver you probably have people saying what would you like for christmas or if you know someone who is a caregiver here's some ideas the gift of time seriously people always say let me know how i can help and people aren't being mean well, most of them aren't, they may not really know what you need. So it's fine for you to say what would be great is for you to come one Tuesday a month and take dad out to Cracker Barrel because that's his favorite place to go. Or if you can come by one Thursday a month, I can schedule all my doctor appointments for that Thursday. Give people concrete ways they can help. Gift certificates are also another option. G giving out gift certificates for things like cleaning, home repair, home maintenance. That is a wonderful thing to give to a caregiver because I believe everybody listening, you're all family caregivers, and you know that caring for your loved one leaves precious little time for things like mowing the lawn, unless that's something you love to do, or cleaning. 
I personally hate to clean. So I will always have a cleaning person. I would rather do anything but clean, but that's me. Other people love to clean. And for the older adult, back in the days when we had nano iPods and, and different devices, you could, I recommended that someone who is tech savvy could load favorite music playlists for your loved ones, or you can go old school and do, you know, the old Walkman. Another cool thing, streaming subscriptions. So maybe get a smart TV that you can open up Netflix or you can download apps. I have, I literally have different apps for different channels I like. So I may have an app where I like all my crazy paranormal shows. So I just open up that app and I stream everything. I hate watching with commercials. I've had people who downloaded the Hallmark app so they can run the Hallmark TV shows and, and movies on all times, whatever is aligned with your loved one. And depending on where they are in a dementia journey, they may enjoy word search and puzzle books. And if you have a dollar store, these places are treasure troves for stuff like this. Adult coloring books tend to be too complex and difficult if you want to get something that's for a younger child. And this time of year is great because there's all sorts of holiday coloring books. And Mary loved to color. Like I got her a coloring book of all nativity scenes and angels and stuff. And she went to town on that. But colored pencils are sometimes better than crowns because someone may rebel about crowns because they think you're treating them like a child. Because that's the thing with older adults, they're going to forget a lot of stuff. They never forget they're grown, which is why if you start talking to them like in baby talk, like, oh, come on, don't do that. Come on, can you be a good girl? And you talk that way, you will probably get smacked because that's called elder speak, that high pitched baby talk. When you speak to someone with dementia like that, you are assaulting their dignity and their personhood and they will respond. As I age and I walk into electronic store, I'm decently tech savvy. I get treated because of my age and appearance. The tech dudes, and they're mostly dudes, they assume I'm a complete techno idiot. And so I, and then I, I show them my podcast and stuff and then they're reasonably impressed. But I've had people elder speak to me, talk to me like I'm fucking stupid. And they talk in that high pitched voice. I had someone once tell me I was cute. I was like, bitch, I'll show you cute. Okay, cute is for puppies and babies. The only time I will use cute with an adult is sarcasm. Yeah, that was cute. I would never say to someone, you're cute, that, no. Now your area agency on aging may be a resource for free stuff. Where I live, I have access to the Mid-Alabama Area on Aging. I will give them a shout out. They are amazing. They have a boat ton of resources for family caregivers. They are awesome. So check out your area agency on aging. And gifting ideas, yes, you can go online. And I love to comparison shop. There is something called the Alzheimer's store. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying they're out there. I have found stuff on the Alzheimer's store that was a lot cheaper on Amazon. Now, this slide is a couple years old, so heaven only knows. But what I suggest to family members is to go on these stores and get ideas because there's usually someone in the family who is creative and can make stuff. And I have had family members make different types of busy boards that were aligned with their loved one's activity. When I took care of Mary, she loved to do needlework. So I bought her canvas and thick yarn and the plastic needles. And this way she could cross stitch using the canvas and she still could make certain patterns and make certain objects even as she progressed. So I took what she loved to do. She could no longer knit or crochet. Even when I tried buying her the big crochet hooks and the, and the heavier weight yarn for dexterity, she might crochet a chain and then she got bored with it, but she liked to um, use her needlework, her canvas, the plastic canvas and make, she was making tissue boxes at one point. And again, 
dollar stores for books and puzzles. Another thing to think about, but just be careful because some of those fake credit cards that you get in the mail might contain sensitive information that you don't want. But one of the strategies I used with my care, my loved one, and I also have seen other caregivers use it, and it works really well, is they will make an imaginary wallet because the person living with dementia does not want to give up their independence and a wallet is important and with mary she had a walker with a little uh a purse attached to it and she would for like she always wanted to have her driver's license her social security card her medicare card and her various credit cards what i learned to do after she lost it for the third time and i was tired of going to the dmv is i took her important docs and i put them in the safe I made, I copied them on the printer and covered them with laminate. And so she had her personal documents. Now, I wasn't too happy about the social security card because I was afraid she would give that info out. But w when she was losing stuff, it was in the house somewhere. Maybe she put it in the trash for all I know, because a lot of things wind up in the trash. And by her having the fake stuff in her wallet, it gave her a feeling of security. I took used gift cards and because a lot of times the people will say, do you want the used gift card back? I say yes. And I would give them to her. And, and so she had cards in her wallet in case she ever wanted to go out and treat me. And that's a whole other uh, topic. The idea is for all of us to think about how can we take a favorite hobby or activity and make it direct dementia friendly? And that is a topic I do talk about and I will continue to talk about in future vlogs and podcasts. Now, the next thing I'm going to get is, what about family members in long-term care? Should I take them out? Uh, maybe not. Because here's the thing, emotions outlive the memory. So when you go there and they have a good time, they're going to be in a good mood long after you left. They, and they may forget that you showed up, but they still feel good. If you take the person out of the facility, they might get overwhelmed in the environment, or if being in the facility is problematic and they don't want to be there, if you take them out, they're not going to come back in. You're going to have World War III in your hands. So it's sometimes, it's oftentimes better to bring Christmas to the person living with dementia than the other way around. And it's quality, not quantity. A 10-minute visit may be all the loved one can handle. And you, if you have a lot of family who are up for the holidays, have them consider staggering their visits, spacing out the visits. So instead of all 10 people showing up at once, doing a couple at a time, maybe over hours or days. If your departure provokes a, a negative issue, if they start to present with anxiety or crying, I don't say I'm leaving the facility. I don't say I'm leaving to go home because that's going to, it's almost like a reflex. It's going to trigger negativity. I prefer to use, I'm going to the bathroom. I'll, because, and I'm not a fan of therapeutic fibbing or fiblets. I'm a fan of entering their reality. So I may literally have to use the bathroom and then I just leave after that because of the problem with short term memory. And I know that sounds shitty. But if I already have someone with very little memory and zero short-term memory, they're not going to remember, A, I was there. They're not going to remember that I said goodbye or I didn't. So I may say something like, it's time for your lunch or it's time for dinner because that's how I used to schedule my visits with Mary. I would schedule so that it was close to lunch or supper time because she handled about 30 minutes and then it got rough where she would start to cry and want to go home the first 30 minutes she was pretty good i would say it's oh here comes your lunch i'm going to go get mine and she'd say sure honey and i'd leave or i'm going to go home and fix dinner for the kids and that was okay so you need to tweak it for what makes sense for your loved one and you and you can say look i'm going to go get something to eat i'll be back later cool because you, you're telling the truth. At some point, you're going to get something to eat, and at some point, you're coming back later. And I know a lot of this sounds like a play on words, but you have to align your communication so that it is respectful, it respects the person's dignity, 
And it also contains an element of truth because I noticed when I fib, my vibe must change. And I've gotten caught out on fibs before, which is why I avoid it. So uh, for those of you listening to the podcast, what you're going to see right here, or what you're not going to see, and I'm going to describe, is Amira's first Christmas. I had presents that I had, I didn't wrap for her, but I did give her some doggy toys and I put them under the tree. And then I got busy and I wasn't paying attention and she was really quiet. And I, I was in my office probably doing something that I thought was important. I came out and I snapped the picture because that's what I woke up to. She managed to open up, uh, she got one of her Christmas toys and she took all the stuffing out and then she got into paper towels because some of that in is paper towel. And yeah, she made a mess all over my living room. So at least she didn't eat any of the Christmas decorations. So I was happy for that. I hope you enjoyed this free offering. If you would like to receive information about free future offerings, you can follow me on Facebook, Make Dementia Your Big. You can also go to the Make Dementia Your Bitch website and subscribe to receive updates about future events and offerings.